Tonight, on this uh, midweek, second to the last midweek of our Family Matters Month, we're talking about parenting, grandparenting, and mentoring our kids. Parenting, grandparenting, and mentoring our kids. And if you're here tonight and you're a parent, it's going to apply to you. If you're here tonight it's gonna, and you're a grandparent, it's going to apply to you. If you're here tonight and you just love children, it's going to apply to you. If you're here tonight and you care about the children that we're trying to raise up in the fear of God in this church, it is definitely going to apply to you. Like many of you here tonight, uh, I used to be an expert on parenting until I became one. <laughs> Let me say at the outset here tonight, it is, it is not just our job as parents, grandparents, mentors, people who care about children to just give them a safe and supportive environment to help them grow up uh, so that they can be lost and confused adults. There's a lot of that going on in our world right now. But our jobs as parents, grandparents, and people who love and care about children is to provide affection, to provide roles, to provide rules, to provide actual hands-on guidance and, and train them in the way of the Lord. In fact, the safe environment that we should be providing is keeping them safe from malicious input and outside influence and all of the insidious lies that are billowing from the extreme liberal, extreme secular mindsets in our world that are trying to creep into our homes and destroy the next generation of our children. As I preached on Sunday, if you weren't here on Sunday, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and watch that message or catch it on our podcast. As I talked about faith families, I feel like God gave us a word for our church. As I preached on Sunday, it is impossible for the church to compensate in two to three hours a week for uh, reckless, ungodly, or even just misprioritized parenting at home throughout the week. The church cannot make up that difference in two to three hours a week. It's impossible. And if a child is raised by media primarily, in front of screens primarily, don't be surprised when they grow up to uh, trust the YouTube sensation more than they trust their actual mom and dad. Don't be, don't be surprised when they grow up to uh, value Instagram's values more than the values of mom and dad. If a child's more, most celebrated accomplishments are sports accomplishments or their most celebrated influence are, are coaches and teachers outside of the faith, don't be surprised if they grow up and prefer education over Christ or sports over the kingdom. Uh, we have to be diligent. We have to be intentional. Now, a word to everybody in here who's a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, uh, a friend, or a mentor of children, and that should fit every one of us. Uh, you, you can greatly complement what parents, godly parents, are teaching in the home. Even if you say, Pastor, I, I don't have kids, maybe don't have grandkids around or anybody, you know, I don't even teach, you know, in kids' ministry. How does this apply to me? Because your pastor remembers when I was a young boy, numerous times where people just like you came up to me in the church and said things that strengthened me, that encouraged me, that fed me, and that got me through some traumatic seasons of my life that you didn't know anything about. That you didn't even know, that, that saint and those saints didn't even know were happening. Okay, so in the church, in the family of God, children are our responsibility. Amen. Children are our responsibility. They're all of our responsibility. And, and so you say, man, I don't have any kids and I don't even teach in kids ministry. Yeah, but you know what God has called you to do? 
Maybe you can have a positive interaction with a nine-year-old in the church in the foyer or a 13-year-old in the foyer, and you can speak some words of life to them that will matter and will strengthen them and will help them. Everybody in here has the power to do that. Everybody in here, I would say, has the calling to do that. You can be, every one of us can be a great complement to godly parenting. You and I can be the biggest assets to godly parents. And we can be the biggest strength to a child, whether young or in teenage years or older, that doesn't have the benefit of godly parents at home. Now, let me say this, parents, grandparents, friends, mentors, aunties, uncles, grandma, grandpa, okay? You cannot compete with godly parenting. You should complement godly parenting. Uh, If you put yourself in competition with godly parenting, trying to be the hero, whether you're a, a big sister figure, a big brother figure, a mentor, a grandparent, well, I'm grandma or I'm grandpa. If you put yourself in competition with godly parenting, you are teaching that child to be rebellious to godly parents. Even if it's in the littlest of things, well, I know mom says you can't do that, but at my house, you can do that. And I'm not talking about getting a third M&M if mom says they can only have two, though maybe that would apply. I'm talking about a little bigger issues. Uh, We want grandparents and aunties and uncles and big sister figures and big brother figures to, to spoil our kids and all that stuff. Thank God for that. But we have to be careful that we don't sow the wind and the parents end up reaping the whirlwind, that we teach them that it's okay to disregard and disrespect godly parenting, okay? The best parents and the best mentors of children are humble, lifelong learners. I believe modesty is a great virtue in parenthood because there's no real schools out there for parenting. You can't go to the university and, 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 and uh, you know, major on parenting, at least not that I'm aware of. You can go get about every other type of secular degree imaginable, but you can't go and major and figure out how to be a good parent. Uh, There's things, every one of us that are parents or grandparents, you didn't know about it until you got into it. Think about Adam and Eve. They're born into the Garden of Eden. Uh, They're created in a garden uh, with navel oranges, but they have no navels. (laughs) They have no parents. (laughs) They came from God. And, And they... They had no example, so they had to figure it out. Obviously, they did some things right. They did some things wrong, uh, like most parents. They, uh, they got some stuff right. They named their boys Cain and Abel, and, and they taught their children apparently to worship God because even after Cain and Abel separated and there was murder and exile by Cain, uh, there was a godly descendant that, that somehow learned how to worship and something survived out of that. But the reality is parenting is a humbling experience. <laughs> Mentoring children is a humbling experience. Teaching Sunday school. Thank God for our nursery workers back in the nursery. Thank God for our nursery workers. Working with kids is a humbling experience because they will tell you things you don't want to hear. <laughs> they will say things you don't want them to say. Uh, it's not, parenting's not for the faint of heart. Grandparenting is not for the faint of heart. Kids will embarrass you. Let me give you four purposes of godly parenting. I'm going to try to stick pretty close to my notes tonight because I've, I've got a lot of material I'm going to try to cover in, in our next 35 minutes or 40 minutes or so together. Uh, four purposes of godly parenting. Number one, to raise up a godly seed. Malachi says, didn't the Lord uh, make you one with your wife? You're one in body and spirit. They're his. He says, what does God want for you, for godly children from your union? So in other words, that there would be uh, perpetuated a godly 
seed that is God's will for families, that a godly seed would be in the earth to perpetuate the gospel. Secondly, to train up children in the way that they should go. Christian parents, grandparents, mentors of children, we have an obligation to raise godly children uh, to strive for this. It's not optional. Train them up, the Bible says, in the way they should go. We have third, we have an obligation before God to raise children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. This is biblical biblical training, and biblical discipline, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It says uh, that you're going to live a long life, a promise to the, uh, to the kids that are in the room. And, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, verse 4, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, the fourth, the, the, the fourth purpose of godly parenting and grandparenting and mentoring our kids is to make the Bible a part of daily life. Deuteronomy 6, 4. I referenced it briefly on Sunday, but the Shema, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, might, and, and strength, and, and we're supposed to love him with every part of our being, but then it doesn't stop there. Put these words in your heart the Lord says in verse six, teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, walking in the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Uh, Verse eight, bind them upon thy hand and frontlets between their eyes. Write them upon the post of the house. In other words, you need to make the Bible and biblical principles a part of everyday life, a part of everyday conversation, a part of everyday interaction. If you're just talking to a kid in the foyer out in the hall, uh, or in the foyer out in the hall, you know, encouraging them in a biblical way. Talk about them. Parents, you got to talk about the Bible at home. You got to make the Bible a part of your daily life. That is a godly priority for parenting. There's consequences if we neglect the spiritual education of our children. The Bible says in Psalm 78 that there were men of war who had all the physical requirements and the weapons to do battle, but they didn't have the inner strength and they didn't have the character to fight. They, their, their spirit was not steadfast with God. Verse 8 says they were armed. Verse 9 says, but they turned back. They didn't keep the covenant of God. There's consequences if we don't raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Let me just pause here and say this, that when we talk about, I said this, I've said this multiple times in family month, but when we deal with family month and we talk about dealing families and just the family dynamic, or we talk about godly marriages, or we talk about the biblical way to raise children. I understand that this touches some very uh, painful wounds in some hearts and some lives. And I understand that when we deal with subjects uh, like marriage and when we deal with subjects like divorce and when we deal with subjects like parenting, this is gonna touch some sore spots for some people, but we cannot ignore the clear biblical teaching uh, for the avoidance of, of the hurt and pain. There are wounds all throughout my personal life in relation to the entire topic of family. So I get it. I understand that. However, we must, as with the help of Jesus Christ, by the power of his spirit in us, whatever mistakes or regrets or hurts or shame or any of that that is in our past, if you have nothing in your life that you wish you had a do-over for, and if that's you, I want to shake your hand. Or if the list is so long and painful of the do-overs that you wish you had, you can hardly stand to be here during family month. Let me tell you, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Ghost, he can equip us and strengthen us to heal those wounds and to not carry around the baggage and the shame. And just because... Maybe I messed something up in my past. Maybe I've, maybe I've had a failed marriage or maybe I feel like I should have done something differently with my kid or my kids or, or this thing or that thing. That does, I, I, with the help of the Holy Ghost, I can rise up fresh and new just like his mercies are new every morning. And I can say from this day forward, I, I didn't know then what I know now, but you know what? From this day forward, I'm gonna make sure that I am a godly influence and I'm going to exercise godly principles in my life. I said parenting requires some humility. 
parenting uh, and, and grandparenting and mentoring our kids, it, it, it requires, uh, you know, some modesty of, of spirit because we realize we're not going to get everything right. There's, we have to be intentional. We, we cannot just put carnal weapons in the hands of our kids. I thank God for education. I thank God for education. It's vital for mental growth. You'll get your kids an education, at least a high school education. I know college isn't for everyone. Uh, I think it's for more than it's probably uh, not, but I, I do, I, I, I realize college and continuing education is not for everyone, but I'm talking about K through 12 education. Get your kids an education. Make them get a good education. It's vital for mental growth, okay? Get them good nutrition. It's, it's vital for physical uh, strength and growth. Don't let them just sit around and eat candy and junk food. Get them some, teach them good social graces and good social skills. That's vital for their social life. And, and teach them good physical skills. Don't, don't let them sit around and be slobs and lazy and just eat junk food all day. Uh, teach them some, it's vital for sports and work and activity. Uh, let them foster the talents that God has given them. Those should be used for, for God's glory. But just like we put all of those practical tools in their life, those carnal tools in their life, we have to make sure that we are building their spiritual character, that, that they don't turn back in the day of battle, that, that we're not just getting them an education, and we're not just making sure they're physical fit, and we're not just giving them good social graces, but we, we are instructing them in the way of the Lord. Now, let me very quickly go through four postures of parenting, four postures of parenting. These are four basic postures of, of parenting, and, and you can apply these to grandparenting as well in the way that we approach parenting with. Some may call these parenting styles. First, uh, we have to understand that sometimes it may be my parenting style that's contributing to the problem <laughs> rather than creating the solution. Now, in our culture, uh, especially in a culture that has made discipline a dirty word. I mean, discipline is a cuss word in our culture. Uh, and, and when you speak of a parent disciplining a child, which I'm going to speak about in just a minute, so buckle up, uh, it evokes, you know, in our culture, secular mind, uh, it evokes images of like children being like insanely beaten, like within an inch of their life and anger and brutality. But that's not biblical discipline. That's not a picture of biblical discipline. Uh, two case studies contribute to what you see on the screen. Uh, one sociolo uh, sociolog uh, sociological study and one biblical study. Uh, show us what appropriate, biblical, godly discipline and parenting is all about. Now, this quadrant uh, is something that we, well, we create, I drew out based on the, the the text research of a sociologist named Reuben Hill and gave it to uh, Miranda and had her create something for the screen for it. But this, this quadrant is based on his research. And Hill, Hill put his research together on this X, Y axis with these four quadrants and, and to measure out discipline and love. He found that this is how the four basic parenting styles that you'll study, and they may be tweaks to these names depending what uh, a parenting expert or sociologist or child psychologist you may read. Uh, but here's the summary of Hill's research. Uh, starting, you, you see the, the, the lines, uh, the, the vertical line is the expression of love and affection from low to high, and then the horizontal line is high discipline and control over here being low and over here uh, being, uh, actually those I just realized are backwards. Uh, so, okay, well, just flip those in your mind. Flip those uh, in, in your mind. That one should be low over here, high should be, I apologize for that. Uh, maybe it's in your notes right, but probably not. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, the permissive parent, okay, the permissive parent in the upper left. This is uh, the upper left quadrant, the blue quadrant. These are parents who are high in love, but they're low in discipline. So that's, that's backwards. They're low in discipline. Uh, this study revealed that uh, permissive parents tend to produce children with very low self-esteem, uh, feelings of inferiority. Uh, parents express a lot of love, but the lack of boundaries leave children with a high level of insecurity 
from a very young age. The kids feel love, but they're never sure of limits, and it creates fearful kids. It, it creates uh, insecure children. They feel very loved, but they're very unsure of themselves. Uh, the second one is neglectful parents. Uh, neglectful parents are very low on discipline and control in the home and very low on affection. Neglectful parents don't express much tender loving care or affection, and they don't give much discipline. This is the worst of all the four quadrants. They tend to grow up with no lasting relationship with mom and dad. Some of you may have had a parent like this. They tend to grow up with no lasting relationship uh, with mom or dad. They're estranged. Sometimes they feel uh, forsaken. Uh, now, the parent's neglect may not be intentional. Parents may be dealing with their own shame or trauma or chaos or addiction or abuse or, or baggage, but these children that are raised by neglectful parents grew up with unbelievably deep emotional scars. And the only hope for neglected children is the grace and the power of God and, and good godly counseling and good work of the Spirit in their life. And I thank God that we have in this church, we have, uh, we have people who have made it through all of these types of parenting, and by the grace of God, we're here tonight. There's over here the authoritarian parent. Again, now the authoritarian parent, Again, flip those horizontal ones, please. The authoritarian parent is high on discipline and low on affection and love. They raise children that are provoked to rebellion. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. I don't think I put it in your notes, but write it down. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. The bar is high, everything is a must, everything is a battle, everything is a fight. The authoritarian parents, they're not just content to win the war, they gotta win every little battle and every little skirmish along the way. They've gotta get their kids into submission and, and authoritarian parents squeeze their kids until many times they squeeze them right out of the house. Paul told the church at F Ephesus not to overcorrect their children, not to exasperate them. He warned authoritarian parents, don't raise children like this because if you do, they'll reject the faith altogether. You'll exasperate them with constant bickering and needling and correction. Then in the upper right-hand corner, there's the authoritative parent, totally different than authoritarian. Not overbearing like the authoritarian, but extremely compassionate, tender, yet firm. They provide the best combination of high love and high discipline and control. Uh, the, the result is a child that has a good balanced self-esteem, good balanced so coping skills. Everybody knows in that home uh, who the boss is. Everybody knows uh, who's in charge and, and boundaries are generally respected. They're, kids are kids. They're going to be kids. But, but boundaries are generally respected. And both of these studies that I'm referencing here tonight say that the parent who balances well love and discipline without compromising either one, love and tender affection and discipline may raise kids that are well socially adjusted and maintain good lifelong relationships with their parents. This research affirms that Parents who express love well and have a high degree of control in the home produce the best, most well-adjusted kids. Hear me. I'm going to just say this. We need discipline in our homes, but we need love in our homes. And if, you are, if you're a parent that never tells your kid you love them, you need to repent. You need to get over yourself and you need to start expressing love. And if you got trauma from your childhood that hinders that, I've got a list of Christian counselors that we can send, help you get to and get you some help to work through that trauma, but don't make your kids suffer because of the trauma you went through in your childhood. There is not a study out there, Christian-based or secular-based, there is not a study out there that does not agree that kids need tender, expressed love 
from mom and dad. And if that's not possible, if mom's out of the picture, if dad's out of the picture, if grandma's raising the kid, if grandpa's raising, whoever, whoever their primary caregiver is, they need affection, they need love. Well, I'm just not the hugging type. Learn. I'm just not the type to express it. Learn it. I'm telling you, it'll help you. Everybody okay? They need firmness. They need boundaries, but they need love and affection too, okay? And let me, everybody else, just shut your ears. If I'm talking to all the parents that have kids under five or six years old, the best time to start is as young as you can. Now, even if you got a teenager, okay, everybody else open your ears. Even if you got a teenager, start now. They're going to think you're weird. They're going to think you're embarrassing. I'm not saying you go give them a sloppy kiss on the cheek in, at school in the high school hallway, okay? Don't do that, all right? <laughs> that might provoke some rebellion too, okay? But just start. It's like a prayer life, okay? The best time to start was last year, but the next best time to start is today, all right? Everybody okay? Priorities for raising godly kids. We talked about the purpose for raising kids godly kids. Let me talk about the priorities. And we talked uh, about the postures of raising godly kids. Let me talk about the priorities of raising godly kids and see if we can get through some of these here tonight. Uh, The priorities for raising godly kids. And again, this applies to whatever interaction you have with children. Okay? Pray specifically for your children. I know that's a uh, no-brainer. It's easy to push out of our minds, right? Uh, But prayer is a reminder that we need God. Prayer is a reminder that they need God. And the older your kids get, the more you're going to need to pray for them. I'm I'm not teaching this tonight because I'm an expert on the subject. I'm in class just like you, okay? We're all in this together. And there's not one person that has perfected it. The only perfect example is in Scripture, and we're all trying to interpret that, okay? But I'm, I am negligent in my duty if I don't teach what the Bible says on such a vital topic that affects so many in the demographic breakouts of our church if I avoid teaching it just because I don't have any grown kids yet. That's preposterous, okay? We've, we, we're, none of us are experts. I'm not an expert, I've made mistakes in parenting in the last 24 hours. Parenting is humiliating. Parenting is humbling. If you're doing it right, if you're not being humbled, then you got a bigger problem. But we've learned some things along the way, and sometimes we learn from other people, right? But we got to pray for our kids. At some point, we realize that I can't dictate every single choice my child makes, okay? Uh, and, and so they're going to find out some convictions on I need to pray for them. How do I pray for them? I need to pray for them regularly. I need to pray for them offensively. Don't wait to pray for them until they start going through hell in their 17, 18 years. Okay? Pray for them offensively now. Go on the offense. And then pray defensively when they're going through it. Pray defensively. Many family counseling sessions could be avoided if there had been a consistent family altar. Pray intensely for your kids. Pray when you're burdened about your children. If you feel burdened, pray. Pray with your children. Pray over them. Pray over them in morning. Pray over them at night. My kids know. Maybe some other times in the day as well. But, but, but there's two times they're getting prayed over whether they like it or not. Morning or night. And morning and night. It's going to happen every morning and every night. Pray over your children. Become partners with them in prayer. Take turns praying. I'm going to pray. We've done this for years with our kids since they were little. I'm going to pray first and then you pray. And if they're too young to know how to pray or maybe they have a day where they don't want to pray, say, you get them to repeat after me. Repeat after me. And they teach them to pray. Then if you're married, if you're fortunate to have a spouse in the home, pray as a couple. Pray together over them. Pray, I I mean, no spiritual discipline will protect your marriage and your home more than praying together, okay? Number two, talking about priorities for raising godly kids. Build wise boundaries. Build wise boundaries. Passive parenting will always blow up in your face. 
Passive parenting will always backfire. It shocks me when I hear parents say things like, well, I'm just gonna trust my kids are gonna do the right thing. Train, then trust. Train them well. Boundaries, standards in the home are important. There's a reason the highway has lines on it. Because otherwise there'd be chaos and destruction, and sometimes there still is. And even if we do our best job to build boundaries and lines, there can still be chaos and destruction. But we still have to do our best to build some lines, some boundaries. You need to have boundaries, and I've got several areas, and you can write some notes on the side here if, you, if, it, if any of this applies to you. You need to build some boundaries. Parents, uh, before they get to the dating age, you need to build some boundaries around dating. My pastoral advice that I'm gonna give you, I've already talked to the young people about this, but my pastoral advice is that your children should not begin, our children should not begin dating until they are mature enough to begin thinking about marriage, okay? Now that might be different ages for different kids. I recognize that, I recognize that. But they, recreational dating, recreational dating. Again, there's not a worldly counselor nor a Christian counselor or Christian pastor or youth pastor that would not stand here and tell you recreational dating does not help the growth or development of adulthood or relationships or marriage. Recreational dating leads to a whole host of problems. And even if you can mine out one or two good things that you think recreational dating may produce, it is overwhelmed by the garbage that it can produce. So, and even at that age, even at the day, have some boundaries that they, they only go out with, with other couples or, or with group. There's a reason we set age limits for driving, right? Because teenage drivers too young are irresponsible behind the wheel of a car and, and, and many deaths have occurred and tragedies have occurred because of immature people behind the wheel of a car. Can I tell you, teenage daters are also irresponsible behind the wheel of a man and woman dating relationship. Okay? Uh, be friends, get to know people. And, and parents, there's a lot of leeway to work that out in your home. I'm just giving you my best pastoral advice here that it's the best you can do, wait until they're ready to start thinking about marriage, okay? Set some boundaries around church. What your expectations are for church? Man, I gotta hurry. Set your boundaries around dress, what they should dress and not dress like. Uh, set the boundaries on where they're allowed to drive the car and, and, and the jobs that they're gonna work and get them at some point to get a job. <laughs> we got... Our world is plagued. The worst epidemic, pandemic that's hit our world is a pandemic of laziness, of slothfulness. People don't know how to work. My goodness. Okay? Don't let your kids be lazy. Get them to get work because they're not going to wake up one day at 21 and all of a sudden have a work ethic. If you're not developing a work ethic when they're young, they're going to be lazy when they're old too. And they're gonna be in their 20s playing video games in mom's basement and, 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 well, why won't they get some initiative? Well, it's harder to teach at 25 than it is at 15. And it's harder to teach at 15 than it is at five. Okay, set some boundaries around what grade expectations are. I'm not the kind of guy that everybody has to get straight A's because I understand different people have different skill sets and different minds and different abilities. But you as a parent, it's your job to know what their level of excellence is, get them to reach for that level of excellence. And if the best they can do is, is a D or a C, then you know what, celebrate that. But if they're an A student and you're content with C's because they're not failing, that, that You might need to reassess that boundary. Have some curfews. Where are they staying? Who are they hanging out with? I'm talking about some boundaries in parenting. Have some curfews, all right? I'm getting some amens from our youth team here. Have some curfews. Know who they're spending their time with. I already addressed two weeks ago, I know much to the chagrin of many, I already addressed knowing who they're hanging out with. But I'm just telling you, in today's world, and I know there's things that we did. There's things that my wife and I did just 10 years ago in parenting that when it wasn't until somebody told us differently and showed us differently, we were like, 
oh, why'd we do that? <laughs> we were dumb. <laughs> and then it makes me think, okay, what am I doing now that five years from now I'm going to realize, wow, that was dumb. I said it's humbling. It's, you should be lifelong learners as parents and grandparents, right? Okay, but I, I know it's a big cultural thing, but I'm just telling you, sleepovers are a dangerous game to play with. And, and again, if you talk to any secular child counselor, any religious child counselor, they will tell you the same thing. The research is the same. Adolescence is the most curious most experimental and most unwise stage of a person's entire life. You take two or three or four or six adolescents and put them behind closed doors or without direct adult supervision and you put them in late at night and, and un, you know, you, you're at, at the very least, you're asking for them to learn some things that you as a parent may not be ready for them to learn to be exposed to some things. And I had people after I said that two weeks ago in our Safe Families Sunday service, uh, I had people come to me and, and text me and say, I literally never thought of that. It never even, that, I never even, that never even crossed my mind. Uh, it's like everybody who, you know, if you've heard the story of, of the lady who, um, the lady who took the ham, she baked the ham and, and uh, she, just got married, she gets a big old ham and gets out the big old pan and she cuts off both ends of the ham and throws them in the trash and puts it, and her husband's like, what are you doing? And you're wasting half the ham. Well, that's the way my mom always taught me to cook ham. And he said, that's dumb, you just wasted. Why are you doing that? Get your mom on the phone. <laughs> she gets mom on the phone. Mom, why, why'd you teach me to cut the two ends of the ham off? And Mom says, you know, come to think about it, I don't know. Because that's what grandma taught me. And so they get grandma on the phone. Grandma, they say, grandma, we're having an argument in our newlywed kitchen because I'm cutting the ends off the ham and he don't know why and mom don't know why. Grandma, why'd you teach us this? She says, you guys still do that? She said, I only did that because we had a pan that was so small it wouldn't fit the whole ham. And our refrigerator wasn't good so the meat would spoil. So I just tossed it, that's, that's a, you know. <laughs> but because nobody stopped and thought about what we were doing. And I'm telling you there's some things as parents, sleepovers are one of them. Dating is another one that if we just stop and think about, if we just stop and don't just do what everybody else in culture is doing, but if we just stop and think, we realize that we may be putting our kids at an unnecessary risk. Friends, know who their friends are, know who they're hanging out with, know who they're texting. We dealt with that a week ago on a Wednesday. After school activities, know what they're involved in, know, know what kind of entertainment. Mom and dad, get together. If you don't get together on, this, on these boundaries, your children will divide and conquer you. You gotta get together on what they wear, where they go, who they hang with. Mom and dad got to get together. I would rather you be a little too loose of a parent or a little too tight of a parent than to be divided as parents. They'll play you like a fiddle. <laughs> Involvement with your children. Man, I got to hurry. Involvement with your children. I'm not suggesting uh, that you be involved in every single thing that your child does or has, okay? But you got to be engaged with your kids. Parents, grandparents, mentors, if you love children, if you have a pat, you gotta be engaged with those kids. Now, I'm not talking about being a helicopter mom or a helicopter dad, okay? That's problematic. You're gonna create a huge problem there if they literally are raised in a bubble and they can't do anything and bless God, they can't even go to school because you can't be their teacher and they can't go to nursery because you can't be their nursery worker and they can't go to Sunday school because you can't be their Sunday school teacher. I mean, that Houston... We have a problem, okay? You're gonna, you're gonna create a problem in that child. I'm speaking more about an involvement that crawls inside of their mind and crawls inside of their heart. You gotta get in their mind. You gotta get in their heart. You gotta have heart and soul talk times together. You gotta, here, here's the sobering truth. You can live in the same house but not really know what's going on with them. So 
I'm encouraging every parent, if you got a kid at home or a grandparent that's raising a kid, leave here with this assumption tonight. Even if you think you do, it would be best to leave here with the assumption, I don't know what's going on in my kid's life. And go home and have some communication. Not all tonight, you'll wear them out. They're gonna be like, the, all, the, all the young people are gonna be like, what are you doing to us, Pastor? <laughs> we should have sent you guys out for donuts tonight. I was asking my kids some questions about what I was teaching tonight, and I was asking their input on some of what I was teaching tonight. And where, where's he at? Zion uh, said, uh, <laughs> he said, he said, Dad, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but like, what does this have to do with the youth group? <laughs> I had to think real fast. <laughs> I said, well, y'all are gonna be parents one day if the Lord tarries. He said, okay, that makes sense. So, so you guys just keep these notes for 20 years until you're parents, okay? <laughs> I, I, I know you may be pushed on, you may be pressed, but involvement means you don't lose your heart when you don't see immediate results. Too many parents surrender. They let the kids have their way because there's a little conflict. Uh, you know, uh, praise them, be involved, uh, stick to your guns, have consistency, okay? Um, let me Let me talk about the fourth priority of parenting, loving and appropriate discipline. Three key words here. I don't think I put this in your notes, but three key words, consistency, appropriate, and loving. James Dobson tells a story about a boy who was told not to cross a line, and he crossed the line, and he looked up at his parents and said, so what are you going to do about it? (laughs) Teach you killed Teach your children, don't kill your children, teach your children (laughs) discipline. What does the Bible say about corporate discipline? Uh, The Bible has a lot to say about corporate, the corporal discipline, spanking. Uh, Proverbs 13. I, don't, I, I can't go through all these verses for the sake of time. Proverbs 13, they're, they're in your notes. You can look them up. Proverbs 13, spare the rod, spoil the sun. Proverbs 19, chasten them while there is hope. Proverbs 22, the rod of correction will drive foolishness from him. Proverbs 23, uh, beat him with a rod. If not, he will die. Beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 29, the rod, and, and give him the rod and rebuke them. And if the left to themselves, they'll bring shame. Proverbs 29, uh, correct them and they will give you rest. They'll give you delight in your soul. Look at the number of times rod or whipping or spoon or switch is used in the Bible. Hear me. I know this is a hot topic. I am just teaching the Bible tonight. I know there are strong feelings about this. I, I, I understand that. But I'm saying, if your attitude is that I will never spank my kids, that is not, no, nobody clap, nobody amen. Just hear me out. This can be a sensitive subject for some. Don't clap, don't say amen to this. To never spank your kids, to say, I will not spank my kids, is not in alignment with the teaching of Scripture. But to spank your kids for everything is also not in alignment with the teaching of Scripture. Because Paul said, do not provoke them to anger or wrath or resent them, resentment. So to spank them for everything, that's not scriptural. To never say, I'm never gonna discipline my kids that way because maybe there was trauma in your life around, that's not good Bible teaching either. I've been asked the question before, uh, do you spank with a switch, a paddle, a spoon, a, a hand? My, uh, there's no Bible on this. There's several times the word rod is mentioned, so you could just take that and say, not the hand. Uh, I want their, them to associate my hands with love and affection and hugs and, and holding, and so I'm going to use something else. And I said appropriate and love. That means appropriate that you shouldn't be doing it past a certain age, okay? They're, 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 and you probably sh- you shouldn't be doing it before a certain age. And it, 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 so, so you're going to create rebellion if you try to bend your 15 or 16 year old and give them a whooping. Okay. That's not wise. That's not good. Okay. Um, and with love, uh, parents shouldn't be divided on discipline, but show them love, hold them. You know, there's been times, and maybe you think I'm a baby for this and that's okay. But there's been times I've disciplined my children that I have wept and just, just wept. Okay. Parents, you understand. Now, saying that, 
Don't ever say to them, this hurts me more than it hurts you because no kid has ever believed that in the history of humanity. <laughs> they're gonna look at you, they're saying, liar. <laughs> All right? I'm not talking about beating, I'm not talking about whipping them, I'm not talking about causing injury, okay? But some temporary discomfort, you know, the rod of correction to the seat of instruction can do wonders, okay? Intentional training, uh, be intentional, help them. They don't know where they're going. You gotta help them know. This idea that we're gonna let kids decide what they wanna be and who, what they, I mean, they're like, this, like, dear Lord, we have lost our ever-loving minds in this culture, okay? Gui give them some guidance, give them some training, help them to set some goals early in life. Put, teach them to put God first, teach them to be dependable, teach them to persevere, uh, te teach them to have some values. Uh, repeat these lessons continuously, train them continuously. They're gonna be tested on, all the time, they're gonna be tested, so teach them. Teach them accountability. Who are you going with? Where are you gonna be? Uh, let them be accountable. Um, one of the biggest lessons you can take away in parenting is do not ins do, don't expect what you don't inspect. Don't expect what you don't inspect. So if you're going to say this, but you're never going to check that they do it, you're creating a res recipe for rebellion. Okay, C teach them accountability. Uh, involving of others, number six, let others help raise your kids. What? Yes, let others help raise your kids. Uh, it used to be that if an adult saw a child, a good, reasonable adult, saw a child misbehaving, that they could let the parents know or say, hey, stop that, and, and tell the parents. Now, people don't want their kids getting corrected by nobody. I mean, parents get mad at youth leaders for correcting their kids. Parents get mad at pastors for correcting their kids. <laughs> kids suffer when that is the environment at the home. If you, it takes a village. Yeah, it does, Ben. It sure does. It takes all of us. And, and so don't be a jerk. And, and I said rules without relationship breed rebellion. So if you've never talked to that kid before, if you've never told him, man, if all you've done is pick on him or you have never talked to him, don't go trying to have some big corrective conversation, okay? Everybody okay? Everybody still breathing? Everybody still alive? We good? Okay? Uh, you know, it's okay to correct them. And, and, and make sure you give others the latitude with your children. I, I hope you give the ministry of the church permission to admonish your children. I hope you give the children's ministry permission to admonish your children. I hope you give uh, youth ministry permission to admonish your children. It really does take a, a village. And if every time your child is corrected, they come to you and they tell you some story about the teacher and you take their side, you have a problem. If every time the youth pastor gets on their case, you get an attitude with the youth pastor, you have a problem. Okay? We okay? Everybody breathing? Provide direction. Number seven. I'm almost done. I promise. I know it's been a painful night. <laughs> There's, there's four goals, I got them listed there, that every parent should, Christian parent should teach their children a certain identity. I already touched on this, but every child has a unique fingerprint, a voice print, a retina print. Uh, God has given them a unique identity. Parents, it's our job to identify that identity. I'm not talking about sexual identity. I'm not talking about gender identity. That's established. There's two genders and there's two identities. That's it. And, and, and no matter how many more they tell you, that, that's it biblically and, and, and that's it physiologically, okay? But, but help shape them into what God wants them to be. God has a unique plan for their life. It's up to you to help shape that. Teach them that they're made in the image of God. Teach our young boys to be men, masculine men. Masculinity is not a dirty word. Teach our young ladies to be ladies. Modesty and holiness and shame, faith, this, to this. Those are not dirty words. Those are biblical concepts, okay? Uh, we need boys to raise up to be good 
men. And that can't happen if we disparage masculinity and, and if we pretend that masculinity and femininity are just, uh, are, are just pure social constructs that, that are created and can be just disregarded. That They're not social constructs. They're biblical constructs. They're God-created constructs, okay? Teach them character development. Help, their grow, help them grow their character. Your children and my children are born characters. They're not born with character, okay? They're born with sin in their heart. We have to teach them integrity and character. We have to train it in. Uh, teach them relationships. Teach them relationships. Provide direction in the area of relationships. The, the university of the home <laughs> is the great place to learn how to solve conflict. It's a great place to teach them what love should look like, what, uh, what apologies should look like, okay? My kids have heard me lots of times say I'm sorry, and they probably, I apologize even now publicly that I probably have not said it enough. It's a good place for them to learn how to own when they make a mistake. But you have to teach them by example. And then finally, teach them to find a mission in life. Every person has a deep God-given mission. And, 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 and parents, be careful. Don't shield your children so much that they cannot discover their God-given purpose and their God-given mission. Don't just make decisions out of fear for them. Man, Sally's not gonna do that. Or well, Johnny's not gonna do that. I, I admire Mormons for this one reason. They train their children to be involved in mission. They indoctrinate them and prepare them for mission their entire lives from childhood. Does your child have a mission? Do you talk to them about what they were made for? From the earliest days, little Leonidas needs to be hearing. Little Grace needs to be hearing. Little Ezra needs to be hearing. Eliana needs to be here, and God made you for a purpose. You are the design of God, and there's something that he has for you to do in this world that only you can do in this world. Teach them mission. And then finally, number eight, persevere. Parenting is not for the faint of heart. Parenting is not a weekend project. <laughs> Parenting is is not just carrying around cute babies and make, taking cool, cool pictures for the gram. Parenting is work. Hard work. Humiliating work. Parenting is dealing with the terrible twos and the terrible threes and the terrible four, fives, and sixes for some. And that's off to school and it's homework and it's problems that you didn't learn in school and it's attitudes and habits and then one day it's going to be boyfriends and girlfriends and if your kids in adolescence and if they're giving you all kinds of grief adolescence has a time limit okay it doesn't last forever if you're losing your mind you're losing the battle keep your wits pray persevere don't give up sometimes it's going to be you that hurts the worst parents grandparents I've heard grandparents decry. They only want to be around me if they can have a screen in front of them. I've heard parents say, my kid told me they hate my guts. Persevere. Stick it out. The, 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 the tortoise wins the race. Parenting is the long haul. Don't give up. Step up to the plate and understand that your mission is God has called me to do this. And to everybody in this room, if you don't even have a kid that you're raising anymore, or maybe you've never had a child, or maybe your children are far from here, God has given you a purpose and a mission to influence the next generation of world changers. Some of them are sitting right in front of me right now in these first two rows. Some of them are over here waiting for their parents or their pastor to get done and then their parents to pick them up. It's your job. You may not have a child here tonight, okay? But we need your voice. We need your strength. We need your faithfulness. They need your encouragement. We have to live the life that models Christ to them. If we're expecting them 
to one day find eternal life as heaven their home, we have to lead them on a daily and a weekly basis. It matters that we are good, godly parents, grandparents, and mentors to our children. Would you stand with me? And I just feel like we need to pray right now. I feel the presence of God here. And I'm asking that you would just open your mouth and in closing, let's just pray together. Would you do that? Would you just talk to Jesus and would you ask him?